Hello. Um, okay, let's see if this works. All right, do you folks see my presentation screen? Yeah, I hope. Um, yeah, it's working just fine, Tom. Perfect, great. Slides, forwards, backwards. Great. Um, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is doing all right and staying safe and healthy in this absolutely wacky year. Um, I'm gonna be talking about ethics in geo. So this is one tiny slice of an enormous issue. And I just wanna make it clear right up front that I, by virtue of giving a quick presentation on ethics, I'm gonna ignore 99% of the space, even though all that stuff is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, but anyway, my story uh, is in GEO, at least it starts around 2009. Um, and I spent uh, eight or nine years working at Mapbox on a lot of their open source uh, products. Uh, I was basically working on it before it was, it was uh, called Mapbox and um, just tried to get us from point A to B. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was in a very optimistic era, um, which I think was kind of formative in terms of showing people what the opportunity was in terms of creating um, new things and creating something new. Um, and in today's world, it really illuminates where the risks are. Um, so the short story begins around 2010. We were working on this thing called Maps on a Stick, a very silly name, uh, but open source is really good at distributing um, uh, maps that you could download and you could put on a laptop and you could use right after there was a flood um, to figure out where to send supplies and all of this really important stuff that nothing else was solving. And one of the problems with maps on a stick was that the stick was a USB stick and USB sticks are really slow at transferring things file by file. So it would literally take a weekend to transfer a map of all of Afghanistan onto USB sticks that we could send it there um, so that people could look at that uh, at the election, um, the 2010 election, which we were analyzing for um, uh, whether it got stolen, um, it did. Uh, so we created this thing called MB tiles, um, which was all of those files combined into one into an SQLite database. That was really all it did. Um, and it was simple enough that like a few years later, um, it had kind of caught on, people were using it, um, but it was a very lazy spec. We just kind of put it out there and thought whoever wants to use it um, can use it. It'll be in the open source spirit. Um, but finally it kind of attracted enough in, uh, interest and people wanted enough of it that um, the OGC reached out. And so this was my first time being on like a real, you know, committee committee. Um, it was interesting. I was, I was a kind of young kid. I was just trying to make something cool. Um, and we were expanding to map tiles and vector data. And then there were some interesting things on the thread where we started adding this thing for cloud cover and unprocessed imagery. Um, and people started referring to the bird. Um, and so I started thinking like, you know, what's the bird? Um, and it didn't take that long to realize that the bird was a drone, um, that one of the main sponsors of the product uh, of, of the spec that we were creating their main use case was transferring imagery from military drones to people on the ground using Android smartphones. Um, and none of this is really undercover. I'm not, I'm not breaking any NDAs by saying this, um, especially in the United States, the line between NGOs and disaster relief and the military is extremely blurry. Um, they use each other's lingo. They use a lot of each other's resources. Um, and the OGC is very active and open about who funds its thing. But nevertheless, uh, it really was the first time that I thought, what am, what am I making and who is it for? Um, and it all started with this really, this kind of innocent idea, just maps on a stick, a, a silly isometric drawing of a USB stick. 
Um, but as Hemingway says, all things truly wicked start from an innocence. Um, so it drove home this question of technology being neutral. And I agree with Donna Haraway that the answer is no. Um, but I think these five questions that I think you should really ask yourself are interesting because they are not, are good things good questions. They're not questions that everyone agrees on. And I personally know many people who say no to at least one of these, who believe that it doesn't matter who creates things, who believe that you know, even if the original purpose was something that is truly regrettable, if it's used for something good now, it doesn't matter, it's fine. Um, and there are plenty of people who also think that ethics are not universal. And I think that's the, that's the hardest one, obviously. I kind of threw that on just to make this just as extra credit. I think a lot of people are undecided there and that's fine. Um, but to ask, does it matter who makes things? I think Merc the, the Mercator map projection is, it's much like the Jon Snow map of cholera, or, or I think it was cholera, whatever, um, that it's super overused. But I think the most important or most interesting thing about it was that uh, it was created by somebody who was trying to sail in a certain direction, a Flemish sailor. Um, and it was created for setting a direction and pointing your ship in that direction and being successful at getting to the country that you're going to. But now it's used for teaching kids about the earth. It's, and it creates all of these unexpected ideas about the relative importance and the relative size of places. Um, it creates a lot of very uh, deeply set beliefs that are with us our entire lives. Um, I think certainly for me, I, I grew up seeing a lot of Mercator maps, certainly more than Gall Peters. And the influence of this Flemish sailor and then all the people who followed uh, his example um, is pretty strong um, in my experience. So I think in the Mercator example, we could say that yes, it kind of does matter who created a thing because that says what their intent is and that says what the properties of the thing are. And a lot of these things, a lot of the other examples of what things are, uh, are based on are hidden in the names. So the EPSG codes, which we use for projections, it stands for the European Petroleum Survey Group. It's, um, it's a group for natural resource extraction. It's kind of a, um, a industry organization for different oil companies. Um, so you might just know that from EPSG 4326, which is the worst projection and EPSG 900913, which fun fact is just Google upside down. It's the Google projection. Um, but this is a ramification. The fact that the people standardizing uh, these codes are the people extracting oil from the earth um, actually does trickle into a lot of other spaces. And we see that in a lot of essentially the large GIS players. So if you look at Esri and Infosys, um, they have very large natural resources extraction businesses. Um, they also have very large, uh, you know, uh, natural resources preservation businesses. But of course, there is, uh, you know, do two things cancel each other out? And then finally, like, does the does the original purpose matter? In another kind of giveaway, the KML, uh, which you might know from a KML file, it's for Keyhole which is the company that Google acquired to create Google Earth. Um, it was originally a company that was uh, trying to specialize on roof inspections. So you could look at your roof from space and see if it needs uh, repair. Um, but it was basically kept alive and it became what it was because it was funded from InQtel, um, which is one of, it's funded from uh, the CIA, the NGA and the US um, intelligence community as a whole. Um, and then finally, advertisers. Uh, we have to think about the fact that most commercial maps are now ad-driven. Um, that's especially Google, which is creating kind of uh, an ad revenue stream to keep that part of the business revenue neutral. Um, but there are also behind the scenes things like factual. And recently the two have been combining. So the ad tech and the military tech, as uh, this was actually just released today, so I just slotted in this slide, um, but, the 
data that we were collecting for advertising purposes is now extremely useful for military purposes. Um, so in this extremely incredibly scary example, um, a Muslim prayer app uh, with over 98 million downloads was uh, bought by uh, a few of the United States uh, intelligence organizations. Um, and so this is kind of that, you know, it, in, in its raw generic sense is, is advertising data bad, especially when it's anonymized? Um, I think it's not actually that useful a question to ask whether something is just bad as it sits on a shelf. It is only useful to ask that question in terms of where it ends up and what it does. And that's where this all really connects to open source is because open source software is the default in a lot of places. Um, things like Proj, there aren't alternatives to Proj that are good. Um, Proj kind of nailed it. The same with GeoJSON, the same with a lot of other things that we created in this community. They're great. Everyone uses them, like mission accomplished, um, which means that everyone, everyone uses them. Um, and we know that a lot of a lot of open source fun is, is the backbone of what ad tech and military tech and all these other uh, other parts of the world are based on. And this is based on this like this one huge promise of open source is that by giving it to everyone, you're giving away your right to stop anyone from getting it. So copyright law is this construct that gives you a great deal of control over how something is used. And open source is this contract that says you're going to get rid of that control. And that's what all of us do, I think. And in the, in the vast majority of cases, it's a very happy um, scenario in which that unlocks the power of other people to use it. And it removes the individual from this equation to some extent. So you can't just like renege on your promises and take all of your open source back. But at the same time, when extremely powerful entities are using what we create um, roughly paraphrasing for evil, um, it's a little bit odd to keep this, uh, to keep this going, um, to keep that same bargain in place. And I think that really connects to number four of doesn't matter how it's used because it's very hard to create something and know how it's used. And it's also impossible to create something and control how it's used because of that promise of open source. Um, so, to make this not incredibly just a downer, I do want to point out at least uh, two things that I think are interesting in this space. The first is ethos licensing, licensing um, which is super controversial. Um, both lawyers and open source developers and companies have very strong opinions about it. But essentially it's a change in the deal that you make with an open source license in which instead of saying, I give everyone the right to use this software, you put restrictions on the use of the software. And legally, this is, this is pretty fine. Like you can do it. Um, uh, the act of creating something gives you very strong control over how that thing is used. Um, of course, it makes lawyers pretty angry because it's not compatible with other licenses most of the time. Uh, it makes consumers angry or it makes companies angry because if you say, uh, that this software can't be used for drones and it's a lawful drone company or it's the part of the CIA that works with NGOs, is that okay or no, it's in a legal gray area. Uh, but nevertheless, ethos licensing is one of the most interesting developments in open source, in my opinion, um, because it does change that fundamental contract and it gets rid of the, the sort of uh, license zero philosophy in which uh, licenses have zero claim on how things are used. Um, whether or not this is a useful trade-off in the future and whether or not people actually use it, um, I think is, is really up to communities and individual developers. The other thing is the dream of, of democratizing maps is really, it really should be the dream of democratizing map making. And so I really appreciated that um, the introduction to this also covered how um, Australia and uh, New Zealand and lots of countries have land that isn't theirs. I personally, I'm in San Francisco, I'm on Ohlone land, um, and there are projects to reestablish these boundaries. Um, uh, so nativeland.ca is a map that's contributed by many people and it maps Native American territories or well, 
uh, Native American places where they lived because they weren't immature enough to create artificial boundaries between each other. Um, but there are also things like digital democracy, which are the fruition of offline mapping in which people create maps of their own space and they set their own, own boundaries um, for themselves, um, which I think is a really powerful idea and uh, is, is something that even extremely progressive projects like uh, you know, OpenStreetMap or um, other tools for, for making your own maps, that's, a, that's an area which is even ahead of, of those projects. Um, so this is really just kind of a whistle stop tour of this enormous subject, as I was saying. Um, but I am basing this roughly off of a blog post that I wrote a couple of months ago. Um, this is the link to it and I'll post it on Twitter, et cetera. Um, but it, oh, it covers these object, uh, covers these uh, subjects and has all the links and um, you know words and uh, fewer ums and ahs in it. Uh, so I hope you all enjoyed and I also hope that uh, my internet connection didn't die in the middle of that. Oh, that was great, Tom. That's uh, some really interesting topics you bring up that a lot of people don't engage in, but this is a good introduction to it. Uh, we don't have any questions in the Q&A, but I have a question. Oh, here's one from Steve. Any examples of the ethos licensing in the wild? Have you seen any? Uh, yeah, JSON is the current, the JSON specification is the current big, crazy example of that. Um, I think there are a few others, but they're pretty weird. Um, there was one that banned Palantir, which was quickly withdrawn, and there was a server software that banned people using it for porn sites, um, Lightspeed. Um, that was like one of the first ones. Uh, it was maybe a decade ago. Thanks, Tom. It's been really interesting hearing these, these concepts. Um, uh, and also, thanks for uh, staying at work a bit late to, uh, to join us all the way from California. Oh, I'm, I'm home. I'm here all the time. Thank you, though. <laughs> all right.